This is Black Agenda Radio, a weekly hour of African American political thought and action. Welcome to the radio magazine that brings you news, commentary, and analysis from a Black Left perspective. I'm Glenn Ford, along with my co host, Nellie Bailey. Coming up, A former New York City cop writes a book on why police brutality matters and what to do about it. The president of the Congo says he faces a threat from ISIS, even though his country has very few Muslims. And the United States has already succeeded in killing at least 40,000 Venezuelans through sanctions. But first... During the Obama administration, shortly after the Black Rebellion in Ferguson, Missouri, federal officials mounted a campaign against what they called Black Identity Extremists. Soon, federal agents were also claiming that ISIS was somehow involved in the Black liberation struggle. Some of the best reporting on government political surveillance has been done by Alice Sperry of The Intercept. She says there's nothing paranoid about black activists who think Uncle Sam is spying on them. I think absolutely not. Long before we learned about this new label that the FBI was using, which this black identity extremism label we learned about in 2017. But, you know, I covered the Ferguson protests in 2014 and and activists there were very much aware that they were being surveilled and observed. And people were already then talking about connections between Cointopro and the way the new movements were being surveilled and were being called paranoid back then. And we know now that they were absolutely justified in in their fears. So it is very much a, a reiteration of something that has been going on for a long time, and even before Cointelpo, actually, if you really want to look at the history of state surveillance of black resistance, really. And according to your very comprehensive article, you found the first victims or subjects of this new kind of Cointelpro in Ferguson. Yes, the FBI report makes it very clear that the FBI started using this label in Ferguson because they refer back to Ferguson as as this moment that really spurred this anger across the country and this demand for police accountability. And then they go on and list six examples of what they call black identity extremists. And in the report itself, they don't mention all of their names, but the first case in chronological order is that of Olajuwon Davis, who was a Ferguson protester that was essentially entrapped by FBI agents on the heels of the Ferguson protests and was the first and in fact, he and his co defendant were the first and the only people that were convicted in federal court of a crime that the FBI is now connecting to this supposed movement. You use the word entrapped. Could you explain that? Yes. Olajuwon Davis and Orlando Baldwin, who, is, who was his co defendant, were young protesters that met during the Ferguson protests. Davis had some history of activism with the Moorish movement. Baldwin didn't really have a whole lot of history of activism. After Michael Brown's killing by police officer Darren Wilson, they joined the protests as so many others did in, in a very spontaneous manner and connected in Ferguson with members of the New Black Panther Party, which is very much one of the organizations we know the FBI is watching closely. And they were kind of recruited to join that organization shortly after the protests started. Around the same time, they also met what they thought were fellow protesters and fellow activists and were in fact FBI informants, who then led them in this months-long scheme, really, that eventually ended in in criminal charges against them. Basically, Baldwin and Davis were convicted of buying what they thought were pipe bombs that were, in fact, not pipe bombs, were fake bombs that the FBI handlers pretended to sell to them. And, And this is a story that, you know, we've seen a lot in the last decade, decade and a half, particularly around Muslim Americans and and younger Muslim Americans that have been similarly entrapped by federal agents, led into committing what is actually a crime, but in a manner that suggests they wouldn't have gone that far had they not been prompted to do so by the FBI. And of course, this is a very controversial issue because they did commit the crimes they're accused of and they pled guilty to them in this case. But the question is always law enforcement here taking advantage of naive young people 
who are joining this protest movement who would have never thought to buy bombs in the first place. And if you kind of go to the court transcripts that are available in this case, you really see how they were essentially set up. Tell us about this Moorish science temple of America. Some of us with memories know that there's been a long history going back many, many generations of black folks associating with Moorish kinds of organizations, but they are quite indigenous to black America. But what about this one, the Moorish science temple? Yeah, it's interesting because the FBI has been zeroing in on this particular group, you know, the FBI has surveilled what they called black nationalists and black separatists for a long time. And there were various groups that they were targeting under that umbrella. But then they also, we know of a number of other, mostly white, actually, movements, especially the sovereign citizen movement. And one of the things is FBI Black Identity Extremism Report notes is this convergence of a mixture of ideologies and beliefs that essentially... Black nationalists, like beliefs that have like a long history in the black community, the sovereign citizen movement that is mostly white and far right, actually. So the FBI has zeroed in on this merging of ideologies between long established black nationalists and black separatist ideologies and the sovereign citizen movement, which is mostly a domestic, far right, white ideology. But, but we're seeing kind of like elements of the two. But one thing the FBI report notes is actually that hasn't really been associated to too much violence at all. I mean, Davis's story before Ferguson was that he had been arrested once because he tried to make a purchase at a gas station claiming that he didn't have to pay taxes because he was a, essentially a sovereign citizen. And, uh, but, you know, like that, that wasn't a violent incident in, in any way. But I think one thing that's really interesting about this story and one of the things we were able to uncover through some documents that a number of groups have been obtaining is that while the FBI was very much zeroed in on, on black separatists and, and black nationalists for a long time, once the Ferguson protests happened and we saw the emergence of this Black Lives Matter movement, which is not a separatist movement at all, and it's not a nationalist movement, it's a movement for police accountability, among other things, what then the FBI sought to do is expand the label under which they were surveilling black activists so that they could include this movement that didn't really fit what they were calling black separatists. So they stopped using the black separatist label and instead moved on to this black identity extremist ideology, as they called it. I mean, of course, we know there's no actual ideology that mirrors that, but, but that's what they called it. And so essentially, and, and critics and activists are pointing out, this allows the FBI to target a much broader group of people. Now, is there any way to find out if one is listed by the FBI or some other federal agency as being part of the black extremist identity cohort? I don't think so, and I'm not sure that there is such a thing as a comprehensive list. Like the way the FBI reports worked is it was a threat assessment report that they created and then distributed to all of their law enforcement partners. So there are now thousands of police agencies across the country that have this report defining this supposed ideology, and they can use it as they see fit. So it's not even a matter of, you know, sort of finding out if the FBI is watching this particular individual, but it's a matter of figuring out what all of these police departments are doing with this label that the FBI said is a real thing. We have obtained some various groups, the American Civil Liberties Union, that the Center for Constitutional Rights, and this group, Property of the People, which files public records requests for documents, have obtained a number of mostly redacted documents that show that the FBI has very much been surveilling people around protests, starting in Ferguson and then following a year later in Baltimore, and then has protests kind of spread across the country. They follow them regionally. And there are sometimes, you know, these are redacted, but there are sometimes identifying details. We published a story that includes some documents that showed law enforcement tracking activities of activists in Minneapolis and a police killing there. And they're redacted, but you can, if you're from that community and you might be able to kind of recognize yourself in those documents. So that's actually something I'm very interested in as a reporter is, is trying to find some of the people that have been surveilled because I don't know their identities, but you know, these are real people and this surveillance has a real impact on their lives. Certainly calls for alarm when the FBI lists you as an extremist, but now they seem to have gone a step further and they're looking under every mattress for ISIS in the black activist community. 
Yes, and as you said, this is extremely dangerous because not only is it falsely representing somebody's ideology and belief and activism, but it poses a real threat to the lives of some of these activists. I mean, as you know, black people in this country are particularly vulnerable to police violence as is. And if on top of that, you also add this label that they're somehow domestic extremists or domestic terrorists, then you're really putting people at risk of being killed, essentially, because we, we know how sort of trigger happy police can be around what they perceive as threats. As you notice, we also published a second story based on some of the documents that we obtained that showed that during the Ferguson protests and the Baltimore protests, DHS and a number of local and federal law enforcement were really alarmed that black activists in the U.S. that were really protesting police violence in the U.S. would somehow connect with Islamic fundamentalist groups abroad that were promoting violence abroad. And aside from the fact that the ideological kind of convergence here, it it just seems absurd. There was no basis for this. I mean, all that this fear was based on were just sporadic tweets from mostly foreign social media accounts that were calling on black Americans to join ISIS because they said ISIS, you know, was a more egalitarian society. There was no actual evidence that anyone in the U.S. saw those tweets and those posts and that responded to them in any way. So I think what we're seeing here is kind of like merging of the two boogeymen in a way. And one of the activists I interviewed, I think, put it, well, we already have this fear of Muslims. And when you have Muslims joining with this scary black guys, as he put it, of course, in quotation marks, that allows law enforcement to kind of rump up its fear mongering and, and demand more resources to go after a really a non-existent threat. And the FBI apparently conflates solidarity with Palestinians and solidarity of Palestinians with American blacks as somehow in the Al-Qaeda territory. Right. I mean, and this we've known for a number of years, like even as all of the surveillance of, of Muslims abroad and in the U.S. ramped up, there was very little of, you know, regional differences, different ethnic groups, there's converging of Arabs and Muslims and South Asians and different political ideology that, that's just like shows how really out of touch and clueless and disconnected from the reality on the ground a lot of these surveillances. But one thing we've seen in Ferguson as well as in other protests that followed was solidarity between movements that is now being taken as evidence of some sort of nefarious connection. And, and you know, if you know anything about Palestine and know anything about ISIS, you, you also know there's no connection whatsoever between the two. But that's sort of how it was presented during the Ferguson protests. So, you know, there were Fox News articles that the FBI circulated that were pointing to the fact that you know, Palestinian activists were taking over the Ferguson protests and showed like ISIS flags in their, in their coverage. And it, it was just like such absurd fear mongering. And the fact that the FBI spent any time sharing these articles and reading them and the fact that federal law enforcement and local law enforcement even like took this seriously, whether they acted on it or not, is just like so completely absurd. Is it your impression that FBI agents in the field actually do take these conflations seriously? Or is it just that many Americans do and it plays well propaganda-wise? You know, I I don't know for a fact. I would hope that a lot of people that are actually working on this closely would be able to discern in some ways. I think particularly with this ISIS story, it fed sort of the media frenzy around Ferguson. And there were, at some point, people that came to Ferguson during the protests to sort of like the anti-resistance to the Ferguson protests, so to speak. So people that came to oppose the protests that were accusing activists of being connected to ISIS and some of the Muslim activists in the U.S., were really smeared. But, you know, I would hope the FBI doesn't quite take this as seriously as as this documents indicate. But just the fact that they're spending any time and any resources, including this in their assessments, it's just such a misplaced use of resources when, as we know, the Ferguson protests and other that followed were responsible like very real threats that this, you know, that and problems that we have with policing in our communities and, and other problems. The other thing I would note is that all of this happened as federal law enforcement in particular massively ignored the, the white supremacist threat in this country for years and decades. I mean, we are now talking about it just because we've had a number of, of recent incidents that you know make it impossible not to address it. But for a long time, federal officials just didn't take that threat very seriously at all. And I've written multiple articles about this in the past. 
So the fact that they would kind of zero in on this like really trivial threats that weren't really threats at all, while not really taking seriously some of the actual threats that we know are very real in this country, that points to the political nature of so much of this law enforcement work. One thing I, I particularly like to note about this black identity extremism story is something that a black activist told me, and I quote him in the story, and he's saying, you know, this black identity extremism thing may be a new term and a new label the FBI came up with, but it's nothing new. And we can go back much further back than COINTELPRO. And what he said, you know, is the state has been doing this in this country since black people organized for any type of freedom. And, and I think that's kind of what we need to understand when we talk about all of these issues. They're not news in any way. They're very much part of the historical continuum. That was Elise Sperry of The Intercept. Former New York City cop Joe Ested has written a book titled Police Brutality Matters. Ested says new laws are needed to rein in the lawmen. He suggests that Congress pass a bad cop bill. I think that if you make crimes committed by an officer, when they cross the line, not just fired, not just allowed to resign and go to another department. I think it should be a federal prosecutor that comes in, conducts the investigation, and you should appear in front of a federal judge. It shouldn't be the way the police department investigates police officers. That's a system set up for failure. It shouldn't be the local DA now is assigned to present a case to the grand jury. I could never understand that. I worked hand in hand as a police officer with the DA. Now the same person that I go to uh, Christmas parties and Halloween parties is now going to be assigned to investigate my wrongdoing as a police officer. I think that's totally wrong. It should be an independent outside federal agency, preferably a special prosecutor. And every crime committed, whether it's assault, whether it's a murder, or anything that's criminally related should be assigned to a federal prosecutor. Also, another recommendation on fixing the problem, you have doctors, nurses that have insurances. I don't, we right now within the past five years, we've played out over a billion dollars in police brutality, police misconduct, civil payouts, and it comes from the taxpayers. I think each officer should have its own insurance. Now, if you keep getting these incidents, payouts, you're going to just work yourself right out of your insurance and you won't be eligible to be a police officer no more. No longer should the taxpayers have the burden to pay for bad policing. It just shouldn't happen that way. Of course, the police unions would fight harder than anyone against even those kinds of proposals. Yeah, the police union and myself, I was elected a uh, vice president of a union. So I understand their job, right, has totally just been diverted to representing officers like if they're defense attorneys. That's just totally wrong. You're exactly right. I believe they need to be taken out the loop. Let them fight all they want. We're talking about legislation. We're talking about voters having the power to implement these bills. We can't, as citizens, worry whether the police union is going to agree or not. We have way more citizens with voting powers than they have police unions. So, yes, we will have a fight on hand against them. But I think overall, just the effect a bad cop bill would have on society, I think that would be something possible to achieve. In many cities, there are black police officers associations. Renault Robinson created one in Chicago that spread across the country. And I remember that in some of those chapters, the black cops demonstrated against police brutality. People don't understand, right? I've turned in uh, officers for misconduct. People do not understand the retaliation and the targeting that comes with turning in officers because the culture of policing is like a gang. It's police, them, protect us. Once you start going against the gang, you you get targeted. I remember once I started really being vocal when reporting misconduct, all of a sudden you start not getting back on certain calls. You start getting sent to certain calls and people are not back you. Now, once you are labeled as a rat, People don't want to be around you. They don't want to work with you. There's, there's a form of isolation that occurs when you actually speak out. A lot of people say, well, we're all good cops. Most good cops who speak out don't stay cops for a long time. 
because my turning point of leaving is when I got called to go to the projects and it was a shooting call. They call a good call is when several calls of 911 occur when the person, the people that's given the, the events of the incident of what's happening, they call it a good call. They said, you got about nine to 10 people with a gang shootout and they sent me, or they was trying to send me by myself. I was like, radio, you got no back to help me? Well, everybody's tied up. I was like, I'm not going to that. You sending me to a, a gang fight, they're shooting, and you sending me by myself. The culture of policing is very macho. When calls come out like that, if you're sitting somewhere doing a report, you put the report aside and you go. You go. It's a real macho call. It's a brotherhood. You look out for each other. You quickly realize, like, okay, these, these cats are really not looking out for me when you start reporting police misconduct. So a lot of people don't understand that. They don't see that part of where's all the good cops at. That culture, when you get a part of it, most people stay. So they just choose to turn a blind eye and keep their mouth shut for the most part. Police departments all around the country, almost all of them say that they're engaging in or want to engage in something they call community policing. But nobody seems to have a definition of what community policing is. And the community doesn't seem to have much to say about what the community policing stratagem should be. Yeah, and I think what the problem is that the police department, right, they have no idea about how to build the relationship. They don't want to acknowledge that the relationship is still damaged and is damaged from a long time ago. And I talk to a lot of officers still to this day. I still have family on the job. I still, a lot of my friends are, are former, retired, and we have these conversations. And when it comes down to talk about slavery and racism, that's a touchy subject for a lot of people. But if you understood the culture of policing, a lot of what we are going through now is a direct result of what happened back then. A lot of people don't want to have that conversation. These projects that's designed right now started from when slaves were free, but they was isolated in certain areas. You can go to school over here, but you can't go to school over here. You can live over here in this area as long as you stay over here and don't come in that area. These days, that's called projects. The police, their job was to go in and enforce and come out. They're still doing that to this day. The relationship was never a positive relationship when it came down to the black community and the police department. Well, it would seem that you would agree then with those who say that police who don't come from the community or dislike the community or hate the black community shouldn't be in the black community. I'm a strong believer. You need to come from that community to police that community effectively. Now, have I worked with white officers who actually took the time to understand that community? Because I tell whites all the time because they couldn't understand, like, why do they have so much respect? Why do they like you so much? I said, you just got to understand them. You don't have to agree. You got to understand this culture. And when we start talking about culture, it's not necessarily race. It could be economical stuff. I police a rich neighborhood. That's a certain culture. I police the middle class, working class neighborhood. That's a different culture. I police the poor neighborhood. It's a culture by itself. And once you understand that culture, you can actually maneuver a whole lot better because you understand it. I've only worked with a few whites who took the time to understand it. The majority of the white officers had the mindset of, I come here to, excuse my French, kick ass, take names and lock people up. What would they say? I'm not the ice cream man. I, you cross the line, I'm here to, to put you back on the right side of the line, take you to jail. And you don't understand. They don't have no idea. So yes, I'm a strong believer in you should come from that community that you're policing because you don't understand that community. You're going to have a problem policing. And if you're trying to build a better relationship between a black community and the police department, you've got to have officers who understand that problem. That was former New York City policeman Joe Estead, author of the new book, Police Brutality Matters. The new president of the Democratic Republic of Congo is asking for United States help for a problem that may not exist. President Felix Shisekeda fears that ISIS might target his country, which is already beset by internal and foreign-supported armed groups.
We spoke with Maurice Carney of Friends of Congo in Washington, D.C., and asked Carney how could ISIS be a problem for the Democratic Republic of Congo, where only 2% of the nation is Muslim. Yes, very few Muslims in the Democratic Republic of Congo. However, more importantly, the notion that terrorism from ISIS is a major concern for the Congo is a stretch at best. Nonetheless, as you've stated, Congo's new president, Felix Chesikedi, when he came to Washington about a month ago or so, he appealed to the Trump administration saying that he, the Congo would like to join the uh, fight against global terrorism. Now, that struck a lot of us as strange at best, and we felt that Chesakedi putting such a offer on the table speaks to his naivete, his lack of political understanding in terms of what has unfolded since 9-11 in terms of the U.S. fight against terrorism, and also really put into question his ideological location. His party is the Union for Democracy and Social Progress, and they're supposed to be a socialist party. But it seems like they're socialists in, in name only, certainly not in perspective or political outlook in terms of being uh, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, and pro-socialist. So that just raised a lot of concerns for us. Uh, and even um, concern about the understanding of what has unfolded since 9-11. I don't know anywhere in the world where the U.S. has successfully combated terrorism. In fact, wherever they've been, Glenn, they've exacerbated instability, created terrorists, and created pockets, regions of conflict. I'll give you a classic example. We look in 2006 in Somalia, for example, when the Islamic courts had brought some relative stability to Somalia. The United States, what they did was they went in through their proxy forces in Ethiopia to try and uproot these Islamic courts, hence sending Somalia into further tailspin. Now, today, Somalia is a playground for U.S. drone strikes where they're killing civilians and there's no stability there. So there's just so many examples. In Libya, which we saw uh, headed up by uh, Muammar Gaddafi and the United States, along with France and NATO, went in to um, conduct a regime change. And during the onslaught of Libya, Muammar Gaddafi warned, he said that if you um, overthrow me, you're going to create mayhem in the country and unleash incredible um, forces of terrorism. And, and that's what we've seen throughout the neighborhood in Libya, in the, in the Sahel, that region stretching from um, Mauritania to Chad that includes five main uh, countries. So even if you believed that you were going to engage in a partnership with the United States to fight terrorism. There's no evidence whatsoever that that would be a successful undertaking. So this is quite ominous for the Congo should the United States take Felix Chesikedi up on his offer to join the global war against terrorism and to bring U.S. military forces, additional U.S. military forces, into the Congo to fight so-called ISIS. Yes, as you said, everybody on the planet knows that the United States uses the presence or the allegation of the presence of ISIS or al-Qaeda as as an excuse to intervene and never leave, even if they are asked to. Exactly. So that just makes us um, quite bewildered as to why Chesa Kitty would even do that. But what it does, Glenn, is to demonstrate that not just in the Congo, but if you really take even a cursory look at the continent as a whole, we find um, the leaders rising to power fit in a neo-colonial framework where they look to get support from Uncle Sam. And they know one way they can get support financial support, uh, material support, is to embrace the U.S. outlook on the world and seeing it, the world as a playground for its military. So we find, for example, the leaders uh, I mentioned to you earlier of the Sahel, 
the G5 leaders. We're talking about the countries uh, in the Sahel, Burkina Faso, Chad, talking about Mauritania, Mali, Niger. These countries, they came to Washington um, just last year, uh, their hands open, asking for $500 million to, quote, unquote, fight terrorism. Um, so when we look in the continent, unfortunately, the leaders that we see in the overwhelming majority of the countries, they look to embrace the United States. They look to support U.S. policies. And that's why there is this profound need for a bottom-up social movement throughout the continent to sweep away these agents of neocolonialism who provide unfettered access to the United States military in order for them to do as they see fit in their countries. And for the most part, Glenn, for the most part, against the will of the uh, working class, of the oppressed masses in those countries. And that's why the United States, in part, supports some of these leaders, because they know they can get what they want from the leaders, and the military support that they provide, financial support they provide to these leaders, they utilize them more to uh, suppress the population as opposed to fight so-called terrorism. We can look at the Cameroon, for example, that gets training, uh, material, financial support from the United States. And the uh, President, Paul Bia, uses that to unleash his military on the Cameroonian uh, people, committing mass crimes and atrocities. A major beneficiary of U.S. largesse is Yori Museveni in Uganda, for example. Hundreds of millions of dollars in um, military equipment. And he uses that to crush the population. Uh, right next door is another darling of the United States, Paul Kagame, which you're quite familiar with, gets uh, tremendous military support from the United States. He's got over a billion dollars in support from the U.S. Uh, over the last decade or so, and he uses those resources not only to crush his own um, population, but also to uh, go into military adventures into the Congo. In fact, he's more of a threat to the Congolese civilian and the population than any so-called ISIS that Felix Chisikedi uh, can point to. So what we see here, Glenn, is these leaders being in, willing, quick, to jump in bed with the United States to get financial support, military support, and they utilize that in order to suppress their population while they themselves benefit for their own personal interests and for the small cadre of uh, elites uh, that, uh, that surround them. Yes, Uganda and Rwanda are the ongoing threats to mass death in the Congo, uh, having been responsible for the demise of more than 6 million people over the last 20 years or so. But Congo is also beset by Ebola with 993 confirmed cases and 621 deaths. Maybe what the Congo needs most is the Cubans, who have been most effective in combating Ebola in Africa. Logically, that, that would be the logical thinking, that based on the support that the Cubans brought to um, West Africa, um, Liberia in particular, when we had the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, you would think that that would be a logical outreach uh, on the part of the um, Congolese. And, not to um, deny the fact that the Congolese are really the best in the world in terms of addressing the question of Ebola. It was in the Congo that Ebola came about in 1976. And the leading experts in the world in the fight against Ebola are Congolese, but they could certainly benefit from the non-militarized humanitarian support that we've seen the Cubans provide, uh, not only in emergencies in the case of West African Ebola outbreak a, a number of years ago, but also just broadly in terms of health, because the root of the spreading of disease viruses such as Ebola is a weak, overall weak health infrastructure. And Congo suffers from that in that the leaders have not invested sufficiently in the health infrastructure in the, in the country. And the region where the Ebola is most acute right now is the Beni region, the North Kivu region. And what complicates the ability of the doctors to address or contain the virus is that it's in an area of instability. 
where you have dozens of militia groups, where you have intrigue on the part of Congo's neighbor, Rwanda, who uh, consistently seeks to extract Congo's minerals for no cost at all. And you have Uganda, who's invested in the instability in the Congo as it extracts the oil on Lake Edward that is shared with Congo. So you have a uh, cocktail of factors that complicates the Ebola crisis in the east of the country. We're talking about neighbors who intervene and contribute to instability and exploit the resources. You have militia groups who are in the region where the state itself, the Congolese state, doesn't control. And then you have rogue soldiers in the Congolese military who also are a part of the problem. And all that is placed in a geopolitical context where we're talking about some of the richest areas of the African continent that have tremendous strategic minerals that are vital to uh, major industries in the West. I'm talking about the aerospace, talking about military industries, uh, we're talking about electronics technology. So what that does is that it puts the Congolese people, the average Congolese, uh, at the bottom in terms of priority. So it's a very complex challenge. However, Congolese president calling on the U.S. for additional military support for putting himself up to join the so-called fight against terrorism, that is so far away from the solution that is needed in order to bring about stability in the region so that the, the Congolese people cannot be victims of viruses like Ebola, and be the victims of exploitation that we see coming from their neighbors in Rwanda and Uganda. So Felix Chesikedi is way off the mark in terms of trying to address the stability in the east of his country. That was Maurice Carney of Friends of Congo, speaking from Washington. Also in the nation's capital, a progressive think tank released a study that showed U.S. sanctions against Venezuela have already led to massive deaths, especially among vulnerable groups like dialysis and diabetes patients who are now cut off from adequate treatment. Mark Weisbrot is co-founder of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. The estimated more than 40,000 people that lives were lost was as a result of sanctions in Venezuela, economic sanctions from the United States. That was for August 2017 to 2018. But then in January, uh, much more draconian sanctions were implemented with the recognition of Juan Guaido, who the United States named as the interim president of Venezuela. And those sanctions have caused a much more rapid economic collapse just since January. So, for example, oil production has fallen by 36% from January to February in one month. This is extremely unusual. No, that's actually January to March. It's fallen by 36% and it's projected to fall by uh, 67% over the year. Now, the oil revenue provides almost all of the money that's used to import everything, which includes, of course, medicines and medical equipment and food and spare parts and infrastructure for water and sanitation. And so right now what we're seeing, if this continues, is a total collapse of many of the things that people need to survive. And you can see it also in the January to February drop of 46% in imports, right? Because first of all, that's unprecedented. That's never happened. And I don't know if it's happened anywhere, but it certainly hasn't happened in Venezuela or any place that I've heard about in Latin America in modern history. It's it's almost half of your imports disappearing. Imagine that happened in the United States. You know, it'd be looking at a whole different economy. And this is an economy that's already weakened. So what's happening now is even more rapid acceleration of the humanitarian crisis. And then you point out, yeah, that it's a civil war. 
that the Trump administration is pushing the country towards. And I think that's a very, very important point because that's not really a side effect. They don't necessarily want a civil war, but they are doing things to promote violence because, first of all, they've cut off any possibility of negotiation. So they deliberately picked Juan Guaido as a leader because his party, Voluntad Popular, is a party that explicitly doesn't want to negotiate at all. And that's why they did that coup attempt, but it wasn't a real one in the sense that they don't have the force to, to do that. But they wanted to provoke the government to arrest Juan Guaido, which they didn't successfully do. Of course, he would be arrested in any other country that I can think of in the world. But the government didn't take the bait. And the reason they want that, of course, the opposition wants that because they think rightly or wrongly, that this would provoke the U.S. to do some kind of military action. So that's part of the strategy. And then, of course, the other strategy is to slowly starve and deprive people. It's not so slowly now, but to starve and deprive people of medicine and health care and water and sanitation and we document a lot of those things in the report based on UN data. And that's the actual strategy. So this is what makes it a, a real serious crime. And some former UN officials have said a possible crime against humanity because it's, it's deliberate. It's not collateral damage. The strategy, and, and Pompeo said this pretty much, and we quoted it in the report, that the strategy is to increase this uh, suffering and death until there is some kind of rebellion, whether military or uh, an insurrection they're hoping for, that uh, topples the government. That's the strategy of the Trump administration. Those oil production figures that you cited are really alarming because that would indicate that Venezuela is no longer a major oil producing country in the world. And if having been cut off of the U.S. dollar dominated currency system, they are unable to produce oil to barter with for anything with those countries like Russia and China that are still cooperating with Venezuela. Well, this is a grim situation indeed. It's very harsh. I mean, the government is doing what it can. The last survey data we saw from opposition academics was that they were providing food to 90% of households. It doesn't always get there every month, and in some areas it's less accessible than others, and so that's why people have been losing weight. But they are going to have to get more help from, from other countries and also be able to sell more oil to other countries. But again, the United States government has been pressuring other countries not to really have any financial dealings, but not to buy their oil either. India, for example, came under pressure from the United States not to buy Venezuelan oil. And that's why you saw the first production drop in February because oil was piling up in storage and even ships and tankers, and they couldn't put it anywhere else. Under the Trump administration, the use of the dollar as a weapon seems to have gone on hyperdrive, although, of course, this is not just a Trump-initiating policy. You're an economist. In terms of the long-time health of the dollar and its status as the world reserve currency, does using it as a weapon endanger that status? Well, unfortunately, so far not. I mean, I think it's a terrible flaw in the international financial system that 62% or so of international reserves held by central banks in the world are dollars, and most uh, commerce uh, takes place in dollars, and that's not really changing over the years, and it should, because you can see how the United States is able to use it. I think this is really their main weapon now. You know, sanctions are warfare. Sanctions are like a medieval siege. 
you know, you basically starve people of, you know, not only food, but medicines and other essential goods. So this is what they're using. I think even, I think it's more of a weapon right now in this period than the military, U.S. military or the CIA, even with the drones. It certainly kills more people or can kill more people, but it also, if you look at what they're doing to Iran right now, for example, their economy is shrinking again because of these sanctions. In fact, the IMF lowered their forecast for Iran's uh, GDP for this year from negative three to negative six percent. Venezuela was lowered from negative five to negative 25, which you can imagine that. That was like the first and worst three years of the Great Depression in the United States, you're talking about 25%. But Iran is going to get worse, too, and that's already pretty bad. And the IMF acknowledged for Iran uh, publicly that it was a result of the U.S. sanctions, and their currency has plummeted, and they've got inflation from that. So they're deliberately trying to wreck that economy. And you know, I mean, look at the first Gulf War, for example. Like, how many civilians were killed in that war? The estimates range from like 3,600 up to 10,000 or so, which is horrible, of course. But the estimates of just children killed in the seven years of sanctions that followed the war are between 400 and 500,000. So you can see how much more powerful a weapon it is. You've been studying the political economy of Venezuela for a long time. Do you see any outlines of an economic resistance to this use of the dollar and sanctions as a weapon? Well, they just got hit in January with a whole new set of sanctions. The recognition of Guaido, for example, and I think even, you know, just from being here in Washington and being on the Hill sometimes, you can tell that these members of Congress who supported the recognition of Guaido don't even seem to realize that that imposes a whole new set of sanctions by itself because it means that whatever the government has and is able to sell in terms of oil or other minerals even, that money no longer goes into the economy. It goes into, it belongs to Guaido. So it imposes a larger financial embargo and also a, a trade embargo. So in other words, a lot of the imports that they even want to get, besides that they can't export their oil, they can't import in many cases because they're excluded from the international financial system. They have a government account, the government of the Republic of Venezuela, and they have the state oil company's account, PDVSA. And, you know, for example, even the PDVSA account at Gazprom, which is a Russian financial institution, closed down PDVSA's account because they didn't want to get sanctioned by the United States. So even when they want to import food and medicine, they have the cash, they, it, it's really hard for them to do it. So what you're asking me, you know, what have they been able to do? I mean, you know, it's it's only been a couple months, so it's hard to see what they've been, what they've really been able to do. They found some new markets for, for some of their oil, and that's what they're selling. And they find ways to have what are called correspondent banks, that is, banks that operate in other countries and will still kind of clandestinely deal with the government so that they don't get hit with sanctions that would shut them down. But uh, that's how they're adapting right now. We're in a presidential season, and some of the candidates are making progressive noises on the domestic scene. But when it comes to Venezuela, even Bernie Sanders talks about authoritarians and such heading the government. Well, Bernie has been against the, first of all, he introduced a bill in the Senate uh, against uh, military intervention, and there's one in the House, too. And he also has opposed the sanctions. 
And you do have 16 members in the House who have opposed the sanctions and about 60-something that oppose the military intervention. Obviously, the military intervention is kind of easy to oppose because you're just, you know, stating the law that, that you can't intervene in foreign countries without the authorization of Congress. That's the Constitution. It's also the War Powers Act of 1973. But the sanctions, I mean, the Congress is still uh, pretty bad. But there is, I think, some uh, progress on it. I mean, it's taking time. And, you know, it's largely because of the monolithic media that we've had for 20 years on Venezuela. You know, the media, even when the economy was booming and people were getting health care and, I mean, millions of people and college education and public pensions for the first time for 10 years. It's probably the best decade in Venezuelan history. And, you know, they didn't uh, report it. So I think it is a really difficult uh, struggle right now. But I think they are going to, uh, sooner or later, this isn't going to hold. I think that's why the opposition was doing this stuff yesterday. They are trying to provoke a more obviously violent conflict. I mean, the sanctions are violence, but they want uh, you know, to provoke something like a civil war. And I think that's the worst thing. Oh, yeah, I should mention on the congressional side, just so it isn't all bad news, the Congressional Progressive Caucus which is 100 members in the House, put out a very nice uh, statement in response to the coup where they said not only that they opposed the military intervention by the United States, which was being threatened yesterday, but also that they opposed the Trump administration's involvement in regime change in a sovereign country. So that's an unusual statement for that many members of Congress in the United States were you know, sovereignty of other countries isn't generally respected in the Congress or in the so-called national security state. So I think that's a sign of some of the progress here. But I don't want to exaggerate it. It's, it's a real uphill battle. And it is kind of outrageous when you think about it, how the level of apathy and cowardice and ignorance that we're dealing with at so many levels is really kind of striking and remarkable, even for the United States. Yes, and it does seem to be largely true that U.S. politicians, Democrats, think of sanctions as ways to avoid war rather than being weapons of war. That's absolutely right. And that's been a problem for a long time as sanctions have become more and more of a weapon. And of course, you know, all this is illegal under international law and under the Charter of the Organization of American States. And really under U.S. law as well, and I've made this point many times, I'm sure your listeners have heard it, that in order to issue these executive orders, and that includes the one from Obama in 2015, which started this process of sanctions. And ironically, this is another example of where he did this pretty much as a sop to the Florida, Venezuela, Cuba lobby, right wing lobbies, because he was opening or trying to open relations with Cuba. So he figured he would give them this. But it turned out to be just the beginning. It's the same thing with the war in Yemen, where he gave the Saudis this war because he was trying to do the nuclear deal with Iran and he needed to buy them off with something so he helped them with the war in Yemen and that turned out to be the worst humanitarian disaster in the world. An example so, of Obama opening the door through which Trump walks. That's right. I think it is a little worse than that in the case of Yemen because he really, you know, kind of opened the door and created the house. But yeah, so I think Trump is, you know, Trump can be distinguished on Latin America in the sense that Obama and Bush were pretty much the same on Latin America. Uh, you could argue about which was worse. But Trump is more violent, and he's got a crowd there, you know, with Bolton and Rubio and Pompeo and Elliot Abrams, who's the special envoy whom I'm sure you're familiar with. And they're really violence-prone extremists in a way that you don't usually have even in the, certainly in the State Department or generally in the Pentagon even. They are exceptional in that way. For Rubio and Trump, this thing is more about Florida 
it's kind of Operation Florida 2020. If they had a military operation, I think that's what it would be called because that's what's driving them. And so they don't really care that much even if they win or lose this thing. They just want it to look good for that particular base. And it's not just a base of voters. It's a base of financial contributors as well. That's 27 electoral votes. But for Bolton, for example, he's a hardcore neocon. And, of course, the others are too. I mean, not Trump, but I would say Pompeo and Rubio, but for that aspect and those people who are more ideologically and empire driven than domestic politics, they really are trying to take over Latin America like they used to have it before the 21st century. So they have Argentina, they have Brazil, they have Ecuador, and they've announced publicly that they're going after, I think one of them called it the troika of tyranny in Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba. But then they're going to go for Bolivia, too, because they got an election in October, and the Senate has already passed a resolution denouncing Evo Morales. So that's what this is about. And I'm sure, you know, your listeners don't have to be told that this has absolutely nothing to do with human rights or democracy or any of those kinds of uh, reasons that are put forward. It's really about power. And these guys are really extreme. They're willing to take risks and violate international norms and conventions and laws in a way that even the prior governments wouldn't have been willing to do. You've been listening to the Black Agenda Report on the Progressive Radio Network. Information for liberation.